to Andhra Pradesh in the south, then to Pune, and then to Ranchi. And um, I've been in four countries, but I have never th uh, seen anything like it in India. It's a, it's a heartbreaking sight when you see little children living naked on the streets and you realize that most probably their parents grew up on the streets, they never had a home, and the grandparents most, most probably did the same. Um, you feel helpless because you would like to help, but doesn't matter how much money you have, and you'll never be able to solve the problem of the poverty because there are millions of millions living on the streets of, uh, of India. India has a population of 1.2 billion. Uh, it's fast overgrowing China. China has now stopped growing because it's become a, a developed country and it's beginning to recede in population. But India is fast growing. And it's a, it's a country that is very poor. Our church is very poor in India. A pastor earns $200 a month, um, which uh, it's just helps them cover for the very necessities. I, I stayed in a school, um, Garma school, for, uh, for almost a week. And the situation is, is precarious, it's sad. The teachers do their best to you know, uh, feed and care for the 250 students, mostly orphans that live in the, the school. Um, but the diet is very simple. It's a lot of rice with a few vegetables three times a day, and the, the children, of course, cannot grow a lot in that type of diet. Um, wherever you go, there is poverty and sadness. Um, and I think we need to give India in our prayers because there is a, an urgent need also for the gospel. The, the government is anti-Christian, and they are passing laws that are uh, recruiting the Christian faith to grow and to do mission. And so the, 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 the people there are praying that the Lord will remove this government and will put a, a government that is more favorable towards uh, Christianity. And so uh, I've returned with a number of projects that I, that, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to support. I, you know, I purchased 150 Bibles for them, which uh, the Lord, praise the Lord, has provided the money to pay. And, uh, the school needs uh, to protect the, the students, so they are building security fencing around the dorms. The girls' dorms is completed, the boys' dorms is halfway, so the Lord is providing funds for that. But the biggest project I bring is to uh, raise funds to send every month to the school so that they can feed eggs, fruit, and yogurt uh, to the children. Because at the moment they only have once a week eggs, uh, one egg each, and uh, no fruit and no, no other form of uh, you know, protein. Once a month, they have a little bit of chicken. And, um, and, uh, and so they, they, I'd like to raise a thousand dollars a month to be able to send back to the school so that they can supply the needs, or the physical needs of the children. They are well cared for spiritually and they are loved, it's like a home for them, but so that they, the school can supply the needs of the, 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 the children there. So they help me pray that the Lord will provide the funds and will be able to supply that because that's an, on, an ongoing commitment. The children, as uh, you know, uh, Simon uh, experience, the children are just lovely. You know, they, they are just very simple. I wish all our children could go and live in India for a number of months. They will come back with a changed mentality. Here we take for granted everything we have. Over there, they don't have anything of the things we have. Uh, the, the, the children, they play in dirt uh, backyards. They don't have grass growing in their schools. You know, I played volleyball one evening and I, I was covered in dust from head to toe. Uh, and so it's, it, will be, it will do good for, to take a group of young people for a number of weeks to India. They, I think they will learn to value. When I landed, my, my, I put my feet in Australia. I, I prayed aloud and I said, Lord, I thank you for Australia. It's just such a blessed country. But I would say that in a certain sense, uh, you know, poverty is a greater blessing than riches because you learn to value what you have 
and we learn to appreciate the gifts of the Lord much more than when you just take everything for granted. This week we are going to spend half a week together. It's not the whole week. We are beginning this morning, then we're going Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and we're finishing on Wednesday evening. And the purpose of our, our meeting together is to learn to pray with power and learn to pray the, the, the prayer of faith. What is the prayer of faith? Come to Mark chapter 11. These are going to be the verses that will occupy the heart of our study during these days. We are going to try to make it as practical as possible so by the end of the week you will have at least learned what and how you can pray so that you know that you can have answers to your prayers. We'll, take, we'll read verses 22 through to 24. So Jesus answered, Mark 11, 22 to 24. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain be removed and cast and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Verse 24 is what is called the science of prayer. The spirit of prophecy specifically calls it the science of prayer. Prayer is a science to have our prayers answered and to have the certainty that our prayers are answered is a science, is a simple science that the Bible has outlined for us here. Before we look at, look at that, I'd like to point out the broadness of the promise on verse 23. Jesus says that we will have whatever we say if we have faith in God. Whatever. Man, that's an amazing promise, isn't it? In chapter 9, and verse 23, Jesus says to the father of the boy who was uh, demon-possessed, if you can believe, all things are possible. Chapter 9, verse 23, all things are possible for him who believes. How much is possible? How much is possible? All things are possible for him who believes. You come to the book of John, John chapter 14. Jesus again gives these broad promises that just that they, they're just mind-boggling. It says in verse 12 of chapter 14, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than this he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Wow! Again, these amazing statements that shows us uh, the breadth of what God wants to do with us if we just simply are willing to pray and believe. In chapter 16, verse 23 and 24, Jesus again says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. It will be hard to believe it was Pastor Sam who was saying it, but I'm actually reading the word of the living God. The one who never lies. The one who stands, his honor stands behind every one of his words. He has said that 
for him who believes everything is possible. That whatever we ask, if we believe, we shall receive. Anything we ask in his name, he shall give us. Wow. Shouldn't we be challenged by those statements? Because as I live and as I move around, I find that we have learned in a cunning way to, uh, to uh, uh, res restrict what God has unrestricted. We have, because of our lack of faith, we have learned to explain these Bible verses that are written in such plain language that a little child can actually gain the meaning of these verses. And so this week, we want to let the Holy Spirit teach us to pray in such a way that we will see the answers to our prayers. I was, I was preaching in a little island called Kiribati, which is a kingdom right in the midst of the Pacific Ocean many, many years ago. And I was spiritually attacked in the night. It, was, it was, must have been around 3.30 in the morning. I was awake. I had been awakened to go to the toilet. And I was laying in my bed. And suddenly I felt two hands that grabbed me by the feet. And very quickly the hands went boom, boom, boom. And one hand grabbed me by the neck. And the other hand began to push very, you know, every time I dropped a bit of air, he would push further. And I could see no one around me. And the hand on my neck was squeezing my throat and continued to press on my chest, and I realized that I was dying. And so I tried to say something to call for help to God, and there was no air left on my lungs, so I could not speak, and the name of Jesus would not come out. And with my mind, I prayed to the Lord, and I said, Lord, let me say the name Jesus. In that moment, I said, just a whisper, came out of my lips and says, just like that, and the hands let me go. I got up in a hurry and I knelt down next to my bed. I didn't sleep all night, of course. But, uh, you know, that lesson taught me that you can be connected through prayer to Almighty God in any moment of your day. And just one whisper of His name, it's enough to, for Satan and all his hosts to retrieve how much power there is in prayer. How much power there is in prayer. I believe that we today in the Christian world, especially in the Adventist church, have not learned to tap on this unlimited source of power. Unlimited source of power. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, Jesus outlines for us the secret of answered prayer. He says, therefore, is a conclusion. The apostles have asked, how is it possible that the tree has dried? Jesus cursed the tree. The next day the tree was dead. And then he says, have faith in God. Literally, the Greek says, have the faith of God. If you have the faith of God, whatever you say will come true, he says. Wow. And then he says, he gives us the answer to prayer. He gives us the key to a prayer life that will be powerful. When you look, when you when you read the, the, the life of the of the great missionaries, the men and women of God who did great things for God, the reformers, uh, you know, even our pioneers were men and women of prayer, and they accomplished great things and they did great things for the Lord because they prayed much. Therefore, verse twenty four says, therefore, whatever I say to you, whatever things you ask. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So there is a, there is a sequence of statements here that are linked together around that word prayer. Whatever things you ask when you pray. So we are to pray, then we are to ask, then we are to believe, we are to receive, and then we are to wait for the final coming of that answer. Today we are going to look at that word pray. Why is prayer so essential? Right through the scriptures we have a command 
to pray. If you come to the book of Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, there in those verses where the Apostle Paul speaks of the armor of the Christian, the armor of God, And he finishes, he gives us the whole description of the armor. The soldier is completely dressed, ready for battle. Then in verse 18, Paul says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. In other words, what Paul is telling us is that you, you may have the parts of the armor, but if you have no prayer, the armor is worthless. And we have to be watchful to this end. Prayer is a Christian duty, but if we call it duty, then we say, oh, no, it's too difficult. It's a privilege. It's, it's an essential element of the Christian life. The spirit of prophecy says that you and I cannot be Christians if we do not pray. And yet, I fear that as we are engaged in the daily routine of our life that is so busy, we're going to get up to work. We don't have enough hours to sleep because we come home late, we go, go and watch some TV or play in the computer, then go to sleep, we only have a few hours, we get up in a hurry, we have to have breakfast, we, and we got to be on time, on time, and then what misses out is the spiritual life. And you cannot be spiritual if you are not connected to the source of your spiritual life which is God. And you cannot be connected to God if you do not pray. Prayer is the breath of the soul. Prayer is the life of the Christian. Because it is through prayer like a golden thread that you, if you could see it by faith, you could see that thread go all the way to heaven and it actually, it is right connected to the throne of God. But if you do not take hold of that thread, you live on your own batteries and those batteries sooner or later run out. True? And there are so many Christians who call themselves Christians, trying to be Christians, endeavoring to be Christian, fighting temptation, struggling with the daily grudge, trying, 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 and at the end of a few years, they are completely run down, completely spiritually dead. There is nothing in them. They have wasted it. Why? Because they are not connected. Prayer is the golden thread that connects you to the very throne of God. And yet how often I find myself making prayer a secondary priority. How often I go to my study with the intention to pray and yet I find other things, to, other things to do. Do you find the same? Do you know that our nature, natural, carnal nature, fights against prayer? Because we are here, we've been, we've been programmed by birth through sin to be independent, to be self-sufficient, to do what we want. To trace our own plans, we do not want to submit, we do not want to depend. And so, when you get up in the morning and the Spirit of the Lord immediately speaks to you and calls you to prayer, on the other side, your carnal nature says, Well, but I have to do this and I have to do that. I have no time. Friends, if we do not have time to pray, we do not have time to live eternally in the presence of God because prayer is the beginning of eternity. True? So 
So Paul says, be watchful to this end. Be watchful to this end. Do not let anything or anyone take you away from the gift, the privilege, the honor of speaking with the king of the universe. Amen? In the book of First Thessalonians, the apostle writes to them, there in verse 16, 17, he says, rejoice always. Chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 16, verse 17. He says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. <laughs> you know, those, that verse seems so strange to us. Because we hardly pray. How can we pray without ceasing? I've asked the Lord, Lord, teach me to keep my mind in an attitude of prayer. Because the more I am connected with God, the more power there is in my life. I have found a simple formula in my own experience. When I stand up to preach, when I go and do ministry, when I run evangelistic programs, little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. I can feel it, I can you, you may hear my words, the, 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 the same things. But the delivery of the message, and I'm not talking just a theory of a message, the, line, the living message that comes to the heart of the audience and moves the audience, that is not my power. I do not have that power. I can be the most elo eloquent uh, preacher, but if I'm not, my life is not hidden in the spirit, I can just say the most beautiful phrases, but it will do nothing, nothing for me and nothing for you. That in order for the preacher to have power, he needs to have the spirit. And in order to have the spirit, he needs to be connected to God. And that is not something that I can do in a rush. I must spend time in the presence of God. And I notice that when I spend much time in the presence of God, wherever I go, then the, the spirit sustains me. And then he speaks to me. And then hearts are moved, they are touched. And it goes the same in our daily life. Mothers and parents, if you want your children to grow spiritual, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There needs to be a power beyond self in the home. True? True? There needs to be a subduing of self in the home and that can only be done in the spirit. Parents, you need to spend much time in prayer. Come with me to the book of to the book of Second Second Chronicles. Here the prophets teach us in what spirit we are to pray in order for our prayer life to be powerful. Prayer is the breath of the soul. Mrs. White defines prayer as speaking with God as a friend. Communing with God as a friend. That is prayer. Speaking with God. When, 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 when you discover this awesome gift that actually you can spend as much time as you want in the very presence of God. And God relates to you when you are communing with Him as if you're the only person in the universe. I don't know if you found that, that, that out, but when you come into the presence of God and you're talking to Him as your dearest friend, as your daddy, actually God speaks to you, God relates to you as if there was no other human being in the universe. And you can spend, you can spend one hour, you can spend a whole day, you can spend a weekend in His presence, and you will find that God gives you full, complete attention. It's the wonder of prayer. 
The soul that prays is never alone. That was the secret of when, 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 when our, you know, the, 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 the reformers, or those who were persecuted, they were put into dungeons. They were, they spent months and months in darkness waiting to be, to be judged, or they would be waiting to be killed. They could sing, they could rejoice. Why? Because they discovered that through prayer, they lived in the very presence of God Himself. They were never alone. For him who prays, the darkest dungeon may be filled with light. Amen? For him who prays, friends, even the bed of death becomes a joyful place because God, your daddy, is there with you. You are connected to him. There is 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. God himself speaks to speaks to Solomon and he tells him what attitudes that his people are to have when they pray. This verse is constructed beautifully. In the, in, the, in the heart of the verse says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray. That is the center of the statement. And around the statement, that statement, when we pray, there is two clauses before and two clauses after that teach us the attitude we are to have when we pray. And it says there in verse, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves. So the first attitude is an attitude of complete assurance. God says that when we pray, we are to come to pray knowing that we are His people and that we are called by His name. In other words, we come to talk to one who considers himself our Father. You are not talking to a stranger. You are not talking to an enemy. You are not talking to someone who is unwilling. You are talking to the one who has given us permission to call him Daddy. In fullness of assurance, as uh, Hebrews chapter 4 says, come therefore boldly to the throne of grace. Friends, this is God inviting us to pray. And he says, when you come, I want you to come in full confidence, knowing that you are my son, and I am your father. You are called by my name. Isn't that beautiful? You are not talking, friends, like pagan, pray to a foreign god, to someone whom they are afraid of, someone who may be angry, someone if, they, if, if, if it's angry may stop the rain, or someone, you know, the, the, the gods of paganism, you go to India, they got thousands of gods. You see cows walking on the, on the market, they do nothing to them because they are worshipped. They worship the snake, they worship the monkeys. Thousands of God, and in the center of their form of worship is fear. God says, when you come to me, I want you to come in fullness of assurance. I want you to have the confidence to open your heart and to tell me what is inside you, what is holding you, your fears, your worries, your victories, whatever is going through in your life, come boldly to the throne of grace and tell me, because I am your father, you are called by my name. Amen? Amen. So the first attitude of prayer that is essential for a prayer, a, a, a prayer filled with power is that we must come to the throne of grace in fullness of assurance that the one whom we're speaking to has completed desire to listen to our prayers. As a matter of fact, he loves to listen to our prayers. God is a prayer hearing God. And as I pray that morning, you can just raise a whisper 
and the Lord will catch it. Amen? Amen? Amen. You may be in the, the, in the most difficult situation. You're never too far from God. Just a thought away and you're connected. Boom. And when you're connected, man, things happen. The next statement. He says, will humble themselves. This is not a humbling of mistrust. This is not a humbling of lack of confidence. This is a humbling of bringing to the Lord our needs. The human soul is naturally prayer. We believe that we can do it, that I can accomplish it, I can solve it. And most people leave prayer to the last minute. Sometimes it's too late. Why would you leave it to the last minute when you can come to the Lord in the first minute? So the first thing is we come to God and present to Him the humility, the willingness to ask. The willingness to present our needs before Him. To lay them before him. And to recognize before him that, Father, I can do it. I cannot heal myself. I cannot grow spiritually. I cannot overcome sin. I cannot do this. I cannot do that, Father. I need you. Desperately, I need you. I come to you, Father, because you are my all. The humility needed is to recognize, dear friends, that you and I, if we if it went for God, we are beggars. We must come to the, to the throne of our daddy with our hands empty, void of any self-righteousness, void of any personal accomplishment, and we bring to the Lord the reality of our failures. True? Yes? If we were to pray more, we would grow more humble. Because as, as we commune with the Lord, the Lord begins to reveal Himself to you. In the hour of prayer, you'll spend time looking at Christ crucified, and as you see His beauty compared to the distorted distortion of your own character, Suddenly, an assurance is born that you're accepted, but it's an assurance born of humility, the realization that you have nothing, and yet He gives you everything. Amen? A complete reliance upon Him. When we, be, when we grow self-confident, is a natural result of praying little. Go to the Lord. And Lord say, Lord, I'm struggling. Lord, open your soul and let him see inside that soul what, all, what he already knows. Amen? Humble yourself before the Lord. In the book of, you know, that we've got amazing examples. I am astonished how God responds when a human being humbles himself. Let me show you a couple of examples. Come to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 21. This is 1 Kings, chapter 21. And, uh, and verse 29. There are incredible stories to encourage, to encourage our humbling. Don't go to the Lord like the Pharisee parading your goodness. You'll get nothing. But there in chapter 21, verse 29, this is the story of King Ahab. He has just killed his wife, has killed uh, uh, Naboth. They have committed a, a horrible crime. Uh, prophet Elijah comes and tells him that it is the end of you Ahab, you and your wife are going to be destroyed. 
And notice the response of Ahab. It says the verse 37. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. The man humbled himself. And the Lord, the, the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tish by saying, See how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. Wow! Do you remember the story of King Manasseh? Similar to Ahab, a very wicked king, he is sent to Assyria, taken captive, and there in Assyria, after he has done rotten things, killed prophets, the Bible says that he humbled himself before the Lord and he sought, he sought the Lord. You know, remember what the Lord did? He returned his kingdom. Humble, humbling means that you will go to the Lord with your mouth full of confession of your own unworthiness, your own sinfulness, that you have nothing to give him and trusting completely in him. Amen? And he who humbles himself will never be forsaken by the Lord. Doesn't matter how, how bad your situation may be. Like that tax collector that comes to the Lord and he says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the only thing he could say. He went, his, he went to his home with his prayer answered and in full assurance of salvation. Wow. Humble yourself. That's what we need. But we live in a society that is constantly teaching us to stand for our own rights, to plan our own lives, to take control of our own situations. And yet the scripture says that we are to trust the Lord with all our heart, that we are to cease for man because there is no life in him, that we are to make the Lord everything. Amen? So what is the first thing we need to do? We need to come to the Lord in full confidence that He will hear us because He is our Father and we are His children. Second, what are we to do? We have to humble ourselves before the Lord. Then the third attitude of prayer that is essential is comes after the word pray and seek my faith. Sick. My this is the ultimate reason for prayer. As much as tempted as we are as to pray to ask the Lord for things, and we are encouraged to ask, if we do not ask, we shall not receive. But the purpose, the ultimate objective of prayer is not for you just to talk to God with a lost list, long list of things that you want him to do and then go by and you're gone. No. The ultimate purpose of prayer is for us to seek the Lord and that seeking is never ending. Is to draw close to God. Is to know Him personally, intimately. After all, God is a person, isn't He? He has a mind, He has a heart, He has feelings, He has emotions. God is a social being. He loves to have interaction. And the purpose of prayer is to link you with God so that you will come to know Him personally. You will hear from Him His plans for your life. You will hear him telling you how much he loves you, how special you are to him. Pray should lead us to seek for God. And that requires time, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yes. yes. This morning, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, I don't usually wake up so early. My wife is the one who wakes up uh, you know, around that time to pray. But the Lord woke me up. I wasn't asleep anymore. I went to the, the, to the uh, study to pray. I knelt down. And as soon as I knelt down, the Lord said, Son, it's so good for you to come and sleep. And in me, personal connection. 
pray for almost two hours. Just like that, the time, you'll find that when you connect with the Lord, the time in prayer goes, it disappears. And then you look at your watch and say, man, where did that time go? Satan has invented an account of it to that when you sit in the front of the computer and you're searching and you're surfing the internet, how does the time go? It disappears like that too, doesn't it? Well, you can serve prayer. <laughs> and you can go right into the presence of God and it is the most enjoyable time. To this morning, I hardly asked anything of him. I contemplated Calvary, I spoke with him about the topic, I spoke with him about so many other things. I didn't present any requests. I don't like presenting requests on the Sabbath, apart from the blessing for all of us. I pray for, you know, the church and all that. But I leave requests on the Sabbath. I just love to enter into his presence. God is always open and he wants us to seek him. One essential attitude to pray, to pray, is that you will long for God. But Pastor Sam, what happens if I don't long for God? You can ask Him to create that longing in your heart. Amen? Amen. Remember, you don't have to create anything. If you don't have it, ask God. He'll give it to you. Amen? Amen. Everything that we need is a gift of God. If you don't feel like praying, you can tell God. And you can say, God, I don't feel like praying. Create in me the longing to pray. And God will do it for you. If you say, Lord, I don't have time to pray. Create the time for me to pray. And I tell you, that's a dangerous prayer. You may, you may end up uh, unemployed. <laughs> the Lord may give you, may send you to hospital for a few weeks so that you can learn and develop the the attitude to pray. But ask him. You ask the Lord. And the Lord is the one who does it. You ask him and you make yourself available. The Lord does it. Amen? I have learned so many things. So many things the Lord has taught me in prayer. He guides me to the Bible. Guides me to the spirit of prophecy. Prayer is the essence of the Christian life. If you don't pray, I guarantee you that you will die spiritually. my face. What does it say next? And turn from their wicked ways. You know that's a beautiful thing about this? Is that you can pray even when you are in sin. Because the result of prayer is that the Lord will show you your sins, will show you your struggles, and in that, those things through prayer, you can turn from those wicked ways. But you must be willing to turn from the wicked ways, not, ex not, not excuse them, not leave them for another day. When in prayer, the Lord has often, I have felt ashamed. The Lord says to me, son, why did you speak to your wife like this? Do not pray to me until you ask for forgiveness. So there I go. Mary is waking up and I say, the Lord just told me I need to ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry. <laughs> then we, we hug and kiss and then I go back to pray and the way is open. The only barring for prayer. Listen to this. The only obstacle for prayer is sin. Unconfessed, unrepented sin causes the ease of God to go deaf. So as soon as God reveals you, as soon as you are convicted by the spirit of sin, do not hold that sin. Run to the Lord, confess it, ask for forgiveness, and choose victory, and then the way is clear. Amen? It's just as simple as that. Give it to the Lord, and then the way is open. But if you excuse it, if you turn a blind eye, if you're doing it hiding, then no power in you know, we experienced this in a school that I was running. And I've told this story here before, but for those who are not here. And uh, we needed to pay bills. 
$30,000 worth of bills. I was running a training school by faith. We didn't have the money. And the Lord would provide for all of our needs. And the money was not coming, not coming. And one Monday morning, I got up early to pray. I said, Lord, why aren't you providing the money? And the simple answer was, there are things in the school that have stopped me from answering. So I stopped praying. I knew what I had to do. There's no more point in praying. I gathered the students, the staff, and I said, this is the issue. We are hiding things. We are doing things. We are listening to things. We are watching things. We are wearing things that are against the will of God. We need to clear the school. And so I said, classes canceled. Go back to your homes, to your rooms. Pray until the Lord reveals to you. And at midday, we're going to gather together. And we're going to pray. A pile of things were gathered together. A few days later, we repented, of course, that day. We burned those things, destroyed them. A few days later, $50,000 came and we were able to pay all our debts. Sin blocks God's, uh, blocks you from God hearing your prayers. See, he is the man who does not answer them. He cannot answer them. He cannot bless rebellion. And so whatever is doing, whatever you are doing in your life, whether you're conscious or unconscious, if it, ha if it appears in your life that there is no power, that there is no blessing, that, that your prayers are not going far beyond the, the, the ceiling, then you must ask the question, is there anything I am doing that is offending God? And go to the Lord in prayer and Lord, humble yourself, you come to the Lord, you seek His face and you say, Father... Show me if there is anything, if you're not aware. If you're aware, you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I am in sin. I have rebelled against you. I repent. Please forgive me. I want to give you this. I'm sorry I have not done it before. And the way is clear. Because he, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Boom! Immediately the way is clear. Blessings will flow. And you know what? There are Adventists, there are Christians who have been living in years without the sweet approval and blessing from heaven. They live their Christian experience as if they are walking through a desert. It is not the will of God that we live a Christian life without assurance, without joy, without peace. A Christian life that is in constant fear. The Lord wants us to live in the sunshine of life, not in the darkness of life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. What are the four things that the Lord wants us to do? We need to come to the Lord with assurance. Humble ourselves. Seek his face, form a living relationship with him. And four, we are, we are to turn from our wicked ways. What will be the result? Notice what it says, the promise. Then I will heal from heaven and heal their, and, and, and will forgive their sins and heal their land. There it is. So as, I, as we begin our week of prayer, I'd like to challenge you. I'd like to challenge you to look at your schedule and first to look what time during the day are you consciously dedicating to pray with the Lord. And I'd like to challenge you to make this week and the rest of the six weeks we have as a church a time in which we will develop a habit of praying so that it will become an integral part of our life. It will become our life. Amen? I guarantee you that if we as a church begin to pray individually, then we will want to pray together. And when we start praying together, mighty things will begin to happen. But prayer must be the underlying of all changes. Amen? Amen. So as you go home today, I'd like to challenge you. To look at God and see Him as your daddy. And say, God, I want to know. Humble yourself before him, tell him that you have nothing to offer him. There is nothing in your life. Bring your sins to him, confess them, abandon them, and then spend time getting to know him. And as you do that, you will see amazing answers to prayer. Tomorrow we are going to look at faith and ask him 
What power does faith play? Do you know that this is why it says that prayer and faith must be studied together? And that prayer, prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks the storehouses of heaven. Why? I wonder if there's anyone here today who would like to say to the Lord, I want you to teach me how to pray, to cause me to pray, to move in my heart that I may become a praying Christian. If that is your desire, would you come forward that we may pray together? If that is your desire, would you come forward that we may pray together? Thank you.